Uh, I think we're going to move on to our next speaker, who is Frances Zlotnick. She's a senior data scientist. Uh oh, uh -oh. hello. She's a senior data scientist at GitHub. Uh, she's currently working in the security organization. Uh, her PhD is from Stanford, where she studied political. Hello. She studied political science methods. Uh, I believe she'll be telling us why her GitHub user account was very nearly not allowed on GitHub. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Hello? Okay, all right, I I'm just gonna stop talking. Uh, but quick one fun fact about Frances is that she's not, okay, <laughs> when she's not, uh, modeling machine learning algorithms. Uh, she's learning how to play the banjo. So give it up for Francis. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So this talk is gonna be a little bit different from uh, most of the others here today. Um, I'm gonna be talking about uh, using anomaly, using or not using anomaly detection on user demographic distributions to detect fake account bursts. And this is presented in collaboration with my colleague, Will Fitzgerald, uh, who uh, isn't here today. Um, so I'm gonna start with an observation from some analysis that we did recently. Uh, and this observation is that fake accounts are substantially more likely to sign up with feminine given usernames than legitimate <coughs> users are. This is pretty weird. This is uh, something we were somewhat surprised to see, but we did have some priors that there might be something going on here. Um, in this talk, I'm gonna cover three things. The first is, what does this sentence even mean? I'm gonna give you some context so that you understand the context that we work in and uh, then explore what larger insight we can derive from this finding. Uh, the second section is about how we might choose to use something like this. It's a quick outline of a potential application of the insight focusing on technical considerations. And the third section is a, a discussion of the normative or ethical considerations. In other words, should we use this signal given potential negative effects? Uh, and at the risk of giving away the punchline, in this case, uh, I'm going to tell you straight out, we don't use this. Uh, we have come to the conclusion that in our case, the normative costs are not justified given what we would gain from using this signal, so we leave it on the table. Uh, so once again, to explicitly set expectations, this is not a talk about something we use in production. This is a talk about an analysis with a surprising finding, an insight we gleaned from it, and the process of evaluating both technical and normative costs um, with using a signal derived from that analysis. Uh, and I also want to thank Dr. Gupta for seeding this conversation about fairness this morning, because fundamentally this is a talk about struggling with the fairness accuracy trade-off, uh, and that it's hard, and especially hard in the security domain where the stakes are high. Uh, so our first topic is to tackle enough context uh, uh, to make sense of this finding that I showed you earlier. So to set the stage, Will and I are PhD data scientists embedded on GitHub's platform health team. Um, Will is a linguist and computer scientist by training. Uh, I'm a social scientist, particularly a political scientist, and a lot of my background has been in studying demographics of groups. Um, uh, so our mission on the team is to protect uh, the safety integ and integrity of the GitHub platform. Uh, if you're not totally sure what GitHub is, that's totally fine. Uh, um, it's basically a distributed version control service for sharing and collaborating on software development. We're also uh, the de facto home of modern open source software development, uh, though there's a lot of open source happening on other platforms as well. Um, our team is responsible for dealing with uh, abuse of the platform or potentially other users at scale. Uh, so problems at the individual user scale are dealt with by other teams with fairly manual high-touch interventions. We get involved when the scale of the abuse means that it can't be adequately handled with those manual processes. So part of what we do is we understand typologies of spammers, that's our pet name for bad folks, uh, and we tailor a response. And we use a variety of strategies like most teams, rules, models where they're useful, and a lot of anomaly detection. Um, uh, our core metric that we're aiming to optimize is that we aim for an overall precision rate of greater than 98%. So that means that out of all the users that we flag or hide, um, fewer than 2% of those are false positives. And that's because it's both a bad user experience and also uh, expensive to adjudicate. Uh, we have a clear process by which any user who's flagged can request a review. But this uh, review is done by actual humans who do it carefully and get paid for that time, and so it's expensive to do it. Um, 
Okay, so what are fake accounts? Fake accounts are our shorthand for one particular type of bad activity. So it's specifically uh, large numbers of accounts created in bulk, usually via an automated process. Um, and this is a problem because it's a violation of our terms of service, which have a one user to one account stipulation. And that is because having large numbers of accounts uh, under the control of a single actor it, or a coordinated set of actors is a big security risk. Um, coordinated activity by large numbers of accounts can cause security or performance incidents as well as community incidents. For example, um, bot networks uh, spreading misinformation on your favorite uh, social network. Um, on our site, they might be used to abuse resources, say for something like Bitcoin mining or to try to get around APA, API rate limits um, or to fake the popularity of a project. Uh, that can be risky because we host code that can be cloned or downloaded. Someone could create a ton of accounts to make a project look trusted and thereby trick real users into downloading malware or visiting phishing sites or doing something else that they don't want to be doing. Um, in addition, prevalent misrepresentation on the site degrades uh, user trust in the platform and injects uncertainty into business and performance metrics. So we care about this quite a bit. Uh, so a key thing to understand about these fake accounts is that the folks who make them really want to make them look real. They don't want to get taken down, they want to fly under the radar. Um, so uh, an interesting aspect of this is that upon sign up, a user only has to give us an email address and a username. They don't have to share anything else. Um, but they have the opportunity to customize a public profile with some personal information. It's not required, um, but because they want to look real, they often do. And they often go to great lengths to make these identities look real. Uh, so they'll do things like uh, add photos scraped from other parts of the web, they'll add addresses, companies, websites, and they'll add names. And names are key because they're easy data to query and process, it's simple text. Um, and interestingly, they, to a greater or lesser extent, depending on cultural context, can encode demographic attributes. Uh, so to give you some examples, um, here are some examples of the default profile with no customization uh, on the left. Um, it's hard to see, but that's evil for any Z. That's my uh, fake account. Uh, and on the right is my real account, and you can see that I've customized it. Um, I've added uh, a biography. I've added a photo. I don't like having my face all over the internet, so it's a picture that my college roommate drew of me. I think it looks like me. Uh, I've added my employer, GitHub there, um, and I've added my name for Annie Slotnik. So that's the piece of information that is really interesting here. So now we know enough to come back to our original observation. Uh, so what we're saying here is that our data suggests that this particular category of illegitimate account is more likely to provide a name that is identifiably female. So that's pretty weird. Here's an example of one of these, this is part of a set of hundreds of accounts created by the same person, not all of which used female identities, but many of which did. Uh, and this particular bad actor has a really distinctive thumbprint, so we know that this is part of this campaign. Does anyone recognize this photo? Do you know who this is? This is Amber Heard, it's an actress. Uh, um, it's a press photo from a Hollywood event. You can reverse image search it and find the originals, but this is really common. So finding uh, images on the internet and just dumping them into the avatar. Um, location. Uh, pro tip, being well versed in pop culture is a professional asset in this business. So <laughs> uh, you can see they've added location data, a website, company, photo, and a name. So this is pretty typical looking. Uh, so we're back to our first question. How do we interpret this? Well, there are a couple of options. Uh, first option is bad actors, so that's our word for the people who are creating these fake accounts, are more li likely to be women. We think that's Unlikely for a number of reasons. The primary thing is that these folks are creating many, perhaps hundreds to thousands of accounts with different identities. We don't think we can infer anything about the creator's personal attributes from the attributes of these um, fake identities. They're probably being generated by an automated process. Maybe the creator's woman, maybe not. We don't have any evidence either way. Bad actors want to be perceived as women. This is possible. There is a large literature in psychology, economics, that demonstrate that women are perceived in some contexts to be more trustworthy, less likely to engage in nefarious behavior. Uh, maybe they think that they'll be able to fly under the radar and receive lower levels of scrutiny if uh, uh, they masquerade as women. But if that's the case, why wouldn't they give all of their accounts feminine identities? So the third option, and the one that we find most compelling, is that bad actors working at scale simply want to blend in 
and they want to be perceived as real accounts, but they don't have enough information to do it accurately. They're basically making a guess about what our user distributions look like, and they're getting it wrong. So the key insight that we take from this analysis is not that bad actors pretend to be women, but rather that there's an information asymmetry. Bad actors want to blend in in order to avoid suspicion, so they try to mimic your population, but they rarely have enough information to do it perfectly. So this is interesting and valuable because it gives us some leverage. We know more about what our legitimate users look like than they do. And the efforts that they go to in order to look real give us information that we can use to identify this information gap. And indeed, once you know about it, it becomes clear that this probably is what's going on. There are fake identity generators all over the internet. And as you can see here, on many of them, there's a tunable parameter that describes, uh, to describe the distribution that these identities will be drawn from, including gender. So what can we do with this insight? Well, one simple and straightforward application would be to create an anomaly detector based on given names. We need to do basically three things. Monitor our baseline rate of feminine given usernames, uh, identify anomalous spikes, um, and then investigate. And in principle, this is pretty simple. In practice, it's a little more complicated. Uh, manual evaluation of names won't scale, so that part at least has to be done in an automated way. Um, fortunately, gender classification from names is a really well-studied problem, uh, and there are a lot of these out there. Uh, it's a little more challenging in an international context. Ideally, these classifiers use really high-quality data sets like national censuses or something like the Social Security Administration's data set. Um, uh, the problem is that that kind of data doesn't always exist. Some countries don't do uh, censuses or they don't make that data publicly available uh, or the data isn't super high quality or up to date. Uh, people have gotten really creative in finding and building alternative data sets um, to try to cover a more comprehensive set of names. Many of them are not high quality or introduce strong biases. Um, in doing research for this talk, uh, I found some that used US prison records or they used data sets that were created by M. Turkers um, classifying names as one gender or another. Um, this is probably not going to be super high quality or representative of an international population um, or even the US population. Um, so the main point here is that culture and linguistic context is really critical to doing something like this accurately. Um, the same name might be masculine or feminine depending on the country. For example, uh, Jean, J-E-A-N, in Iowa is probably going to be a woman. Jean, J-E-A-N, in Paris is probably a man. So you need the location data in order to disambiguate this. Um, additionally, you're going to have probably better or worse luck depending on um, country context. So some languages have a higher proportion of unisex names. For example, uh, we have employee, we have both male and female employees named Tal, uh, because many modern Hebrew names um, are basically unisex. So in some countries, a higher proportion of uh, modern names are can be used uh, typically by the gender. Um, so importantly, you have to factor in change over time. Your baseline rates are going to change as your user base changes. Uh, as companies or organizations try to extend their reach into new markets or become more accessible, demographics shift. Uh, and that isn't a bad thing. Indeed, we as a company and also we as individuals uh, and the broader technology in industry in general, I think, want to see these uh, things change, particularly on the, uh, the dimensions that we're talking about here. Um, so we really, you need to frequently revisit your thresholds, make sure that your implementation is flexible enough to move as your baseline um, and potentially the variance changes as well. Um, key part of the implementation of the process is careful investigation uh, in order to distinguish legitimate spikes from the kinds of illegitimate behavior we're trying to catch. Uh, so for example, we identified um, a couple of uh, in types of incidents in where, which uh, we, we would see a similar type of spike, but that are totally legitimate and we wouldn't want to flag anyone there as anomalous. So for example, uh, college and university students are, for example, more female on average than our general user base. And they also tend to sign up in clusters. Uh, similarly, there are workshops, hackathons, dev boot camps uh, for women that could also cause spikes in the sign up rate um, with feminine names. So to be very clear on this point, the second stage review by a human we think is really critical. Um, 
Uh, the anomaly detector is a signal that something should be investigated. Alone, it's not sufficient evidence for taking any actual action. Over time, you might be able to automate some of this review and learn how to discriminate between good and bad spikes, but given the nature of the signal, I think it would be safer to have humans looking at it anyway. So talking about these potential false positives, I think is a good segue into the third section of the talk, which is, should we even use this? Um, We've identified a potentially useful signal. We've talked through how it could be used in a production system and some of the technical challenges. But the harder and, and in our, important, our opinion, more important question is to think through the normative or ethical considerations. Um, there's a lot of thorny normative questions associated with using um, attributes like this. Um, so even though we've taken steps to ensure that we're only ever using the signal at the aggregate level, that uh, every incident is thoroughly investigated by a human and incorporates other signals, false positives are a fact of life. Um, so this may amount to increased scrutiny on women signups who may be more likely to sign up as part of targeted events and programs. Uh, and indeed, women are already underrepresented in the software industry and in our platform. We don't want to add to that problem. Um, and uh, though we, we have a clear and we think pretty easy rebuttal process for users to challenge being flagged, uh, the additional friction could be demotivating. And indeed, there's a lot of evidence that girls and women are underrep underrepresented in STEM precisely because they frequently get signals that the processes, norms, and spaces aren't designed to expect them and treat, aren't designed to expect them there and treat them as anomalies. Uh, I can tell you that that doesn't feel good. Uh, if um, a woman signs up and all they've done is enter their name and post a picture and already they get a note saying, we think you're a spam bot, um, what are they gonna think that means? What signal is that, that gonna send to them? Um, and in some contexts, uh, this kind of disparate impact could carry legal risk. Uh, for example, in highly regulated industries. Uh, I was at a conference a couple months ago uh, where there, were a lot of, there was a lot of representation from the insurance industry, and they were saying that um, they're very, very highly constrained in what kinds of signals they can use, and they can't use anything that's even correlated with attributes like this. Um, on the other hand, Perhaps we have a moral duty to do everything possible to keep malicious actors off, off of our platform, precisely because of the risk to women and other underrepresented groups from not doing so. Uh, malicious actors frequently target women for harassment, particularly in online spaces where, where they're unlikely to suffer any serious consequences. Um, platforms that have taken a hands-off approach to dealing with bad actors or that have put the burden on users to compile evidence to get rid of them, looking at you, Twitter, uh, have become profoundly unpleasant places to be a woman online. Um, in addition to targeted harassment, bad actors do things like post porn, advertise or solicit sex work, um, otherwise sexualize spaces that make them hostile or alienating to women and increase risk of uh, women exiting the platform. So we have to think about this trade-off then between the risk of uh, adding additional friction um, and discouraging women with that friction at the beginning of uh, the relationship with the platform uh, versus potentially exposing them to an increased risk of encountering bad actors who might also uh, create a really bad experience. There isn't an easy right answer to this problem, uh, particularly in the security space where the risks of not doing anything can be really high. Uh, we think that anyone who claims that there is a clear right answer isn't dealing honestly with the trade-offs. So we've established that it's a hard question, but that doesn't get us out of having to make a decision. Uh, overall, all, our goal is not to present a checklist or a formula that provides an easy answer, but to acknowledge that it's a hard problem, uh, give an example of uh, a case where we've had to think about it, uh, and provide some thoughts about how to go about making a decision. So the first question to think about is, do you actually need it, or is it just something cool that you learned? Uh, in our case, the added value from the signal is really low. Uh, we're already go pretty good at catching this kind of illegitimate use. We don't think we gain a whole lot by using this, and certainly not enough to offset the normative concerns that we have. Uh, uh, in particular, uh, this type of bad account doesn't tend to engage in the targeted, harass in targeted harassment on the site, so the downside of missing a few is really not all that high. So we get to short circuit everything else and just leave this on the table. Lucky us. Um, the second step is a kind of incidence analysis. And this is a concept borrowed from economics, typ typically applied to the analysis of taxation. Uh, the idea is to understand who ultimately pays a tax on a given product. Um, and 
uh, in a market where there are buyers and sellers, uh, and the result of this kind of analysis is that uh, it depends a lot on the dynamics of a particular market. Um, so the idea, idea here is to go through the exercise of thinking about who ultimately bears the costs of, of uh, something like this going wrong. If you get it great, no pro if you get it right, great, no problem. Uh, but when you get it wrong, who bears that cost? Um, so I think we're all accustomed to thinking about uh, false positives, um, but thinking about who actually bears the burden of that false positive uh, and how onerous is it given where they're situated in your domain. Um, at the same time, it's important to factor in the cost of not doing anything. What is the likely harm that occurs from leaving the signal on the table? Who bears that cost and how onerous is that cost? Um, there's not a clear formula here. Uh, this is hard for the same reason that politics and moral philosophy are hard. Many of these things don't come with easily quantifiable units or the units aren't directly comparable. The values in explicitly thinking about it and articulating what the trade-offs are in your particular domain. Uh, the other advice that we have is to be very careful not to use this on an individual level. This is a signal of anomalous patterns, not anomalous users. Uh, at an individual level, it doesn't tell you anything. Um, being disciplined about not letting aggregate signals creep into individual assessments is difficult, but it's really important. Uh, always use with, uh, in conjunction with other signals. Um, if there's nothing else anomalous about it, but just because it set off your anomaly detector is not a reason to flag it, let it go. Um, Set your precision and recall to reflect the costs of false negatives and positives appropriately. Uh, in our case, we don't really see much um, targeted, as I said, harassment of women users at scale originating from these types of accounts. And so we think, and we think that the risk of demo demotivating real women users is high. So if we were to use this, we would tune it for very, very high precision, maybe as close to 100% as we can get, and accept the trade-off of lower recall. Um, depending on the details of your context and the risks of, uh, associated with um, either decision, you might weight these things differently. Um, and clear process for addressing errors uh, is really important. In our case, it's not a secret to users. If they've been flagged, we tell them, and we tell them how to challenge it. Um, so we have a clear process uh, for evaluating challenges to these classifications. This gets a lot harder if you don't disclose to users when automated systems are making decisions about them uh, and uh, what those decisions are. So we are not the first, nor probably even the most insightful people to think about these issues. It's an increasingly mainstream topic in machine learning. Uh, there's a few resources out there. Uh, as Dr. Gupta described, uh, there aren't a lot of easy answers here, but and there are a ton of, despite a ton of really smart people thinking about it, uh, we hope this example starts a conversation about um, some of the, the hard questions that I think many of us face uh, in the field. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Franny. That was very interesting. Um, just to start things off, uh, a related question that came to mind while you're talking about this is the trade-off between um, transparency to the user in terms of saying why their account was deleted versus um, allowing sort of a vulnerability for, for the adversary to figure out how you're detecting fake accounts, right? So how do you weigh that trade-off? And is there concern about reverse engineering any anomaly detection that you employ? Yes. Uh, reverse engineering is a big concern for us, and so we're pretty... Uh, it's a, so it kind of depends on um, how sure we are of the account. So if uh, someone did something bad and all we want them to do is undo it, we will tell them, like, this is a behavior that got you flagged, uh, undo it, or don't do it again and you'll be fine. Um, but if, we, if it's someone who's doing something that is very obviously uh, not allowed and we think that they know that it's not allowed because they're taking steps to try to hide the fact that they're doing it, uh, then we're going to be a little more cagey about giving them uh, information about what exactly is uh, getting them triggered because we don't want them to reverse engineer our processes. Hi, this is more of a comment, but uh, I'm glad you touched on those issues in terms of like, you know, minorities and, you know, gender, because I think that's a uh, underrepresented aspect in terms of machine learning. Like I was reading a, this book called Weapons of Math Destruction and the, the author talks specifically about this stuff. So I think it's a great topic. I'm glad you brought it up. So just more of a comment. Thank you. Do I get to call on people or just? Oh. Uh, okay. 
Thank you very much. It was actually very interesting. I didn't know about all these facts, that all these kind of fake accounts on GitHub. Um, but I, I have a kind of a, a question, rather, um, uh, like offering a discussion of um, a possible behavior. It's kind of interesting that those uh, hackers or whatever choose to uh, represent, like, represent themselves as like women or whatever. Um, uh, but wouldn't that be? Um, more prudent to just um, um, Google all the most actually frequently used names in, for example, US, last names and first names, get a, um, some kind of a server somewhere, like use it, use it to create a bunch of accounts with most frequently frequent names in GitHub. And then that will hide the activity pretty easily. Then did you delete the server and all that? Um, how do you deal with that? Or maybe I misunderstand the topic in general. Maybe it's just, uh, I mean, I really, I'm sorry for that then. So how do you deal with this kind of fake users? I mean. Uh, so I think the, the, the truth is that we know that they do things like that because we know that they're using these sort of fake identity generators. Um, and so a lot of the patterns that, um, that we look for, we don't even use, like, as I mentioned before, we don't use this signal. We don't use any of the information from that, this thing. Like, it was an interesting project to do because we learned something about, like, what they believe and what they're trying to do and what their motivations are, but we don't actually need any of that in order to, uh, to flag them. We have other signals. Um, and so they, they might do that, but it wouldn't help them. So uh, my uh, question is, uh, because you mentioned that uh, it's proportionally higher uh, where the accounts are feminine. So uh, my question is, uh, have you checked that what uh, other accounts were doing, like let's say if a user has created 10 uh, uh, GitHub accounts and eight of them were feminine, so what the other two accounts were doing, it's, was it doing the same posting the same kind of information or was it, so my question is coming from that, that can this be a bait uh, of, of creating these eight accounts and then doing something other from the other two accounts or is it the same data replica? Oh, do you mean are they engaging in different behaviors between the? Yes, so basically using these eight accounts for some mm -hmm. particular purpose, basically giving you a bait to basically change your direction and using the other two accounts to do something completely different. So if that were true, that would be, in evidence of the second hypothesis, which is that they think that you know, if they make some of the accounts women, that they they can do different things, they can get away with more that way. We don't have any evidence that that's the case. In general, they're creating just a ton of accounts. They want them to fit in, and then they're doing they're using these accounts to like do coordinated action. Um, yeah. We can okay. One more. Thank you. So uh, very quickly, interesting aspect of the incident analysis. To what extent uh, would you change your decision based on the cost of, of, uh, of clarifying that process? To, to pick up on the dual thing earlier, if you were using uh, a cheaper authentication, how do you factor that in changing the decision to include or not include? And mm -hmm. a follow up, if I may, is to what extent uh, do you see the, the, the cost of leaving those accounts into the system having a negative effect on the legitimate users of that system? So for example, I apologize for using the gender, but if, I, if, if there's a higher preponderance of engaging with fraudulent accounts that are feminine, if I'm engaging with a, with a feminine named account, will I have a, a, a worse perception of that account? based on the fact that there is a fake account, that most of my engagements might be fake. Oh, I, to be uh, clear, like we, I'm gonna let you take that offline just so that we don't okay. get behind schedule because I don't yeah. want the next speaker to get right. Thank you so much, Franny.